Do you think that e-commerce is a scam? Absolutely. Yep. When someone Googles you, at least there's something there. You just got a big old fucking fat pair of titties. And I think that really is a secret to success. If we're talking about like bras for men, maybe. It's just not as cool to say. We don't want the, you know, 30 year old males as our customers. But that's like one of the biggest lies that's holding society back. It's not art, it's science. I don't care if you guys believe it or not. Who's ready to take their content to the moon? I typically start with a, 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 a challenging or controversial question. So uh, for you guys, I was wondering, um, do you think that e-commerce is a scam? Okay. That's it? We're live? Oh, right now, beautiful. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in what aspect are you asking is e-commerce a scam? There is so much scammy stuff when it comes to e-commerce. Sure. And look, I have my opinion I, on, it, on it, right? Like, and, But it's interesting to see there is a lot of scammers tied to this. Absolutely. And you guys are deeply reliant on businesses now legitimate businesses mm -hmm. but what do you think about that so i mean in any line of business that you get into you're definitely going to run into scammers or shady people okay and so a lot of the time that you would see a lot of the scammers or the people that have made uh you know there to be a perception that they're scamming in the e-com space they're usually fairly low level or people that are just trying to like make it work luckily for us in this day we only work with brands that are pretty well established seven to ten figure brand so we're not as much in the environment but i mean i know coming up like dude we definitely cut corners in the e-com space as well and it didn't feel right but it got our foot in the door and we stopped doing it you know yeah i think the other part of it too is that um i mean there's two different types of businesses there's like cash flow businesses and then actual businesses that are like built for like being sold one day mm -hmm. like an actual brand where you're selling like an actual product and stuff. And um, a lot of people inside of e-commerce are stuck in that cash flow space where they're not building any brand equity. They're selling shit products. They might be affiliate marketers, something like that, um, which is, I mean, the same in any industry. But um, then there's people that are building actual brands that actually have brand equity behind them and they're selling real products that help people. So I would say most of the industry is starting to lean that way now compared to um, how it's always been with like affiliate marketers and stuff like that. But a lot of the affiliates now are starting to create brands and trying to like understand that um, having an actual like brand is like the way that you can like truly scale up and stuff. That's like what they need to, you know, live for the rest of their life, not be have a cash flow business. Yeah, it's not just like what they need to be able to scale up because the affiliates are able to do, I mean, they do a lot of black hat, gray hat, you know, shady shit. So they can scale to the fucking moon super fast. But being able to then try and sell a business, they don't have one. Mm. And so he's exactly right. Like a couple of the affiliate networks that we're attached with, like a lot of the affiliates are trying to come over to the brand side because then they have an asset that they can go ahead and actually sell. Yeah, I've seen that. So the interesting thing is like, um, is there used to be these, uh, there's gurus and everything, but the gurus that were teaching e-commerce or like seven years ago, it was a uh, general store, Mm -hmm. you know, create a store, AKA uh, a store with multiple different products from whatever is just trending and just slap whatever logo on there and run ads to it. And it comes from China, it's, you know, there's no brand to it. Yep. And then it was like, okay, now go to like a one product store and then, you know, sell one product that's hyper branded. So it's like the laundry detergent and you can brand whatever. That is. Mm -hmm. And then the evolution now that I think in an e-commerce space for people who are looking at it as like a business opportunity is the brand side. Let's create a brand. Let's create a product. And it's like, it's so weird that it comes full circle. It's like, well, guess what? The secret to success was, was just doing good to your customers mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you guys crush it. So uh, where you guys are at your specialty and, and um, that uh, is creating content in a user generated uh, content format for other brands. They actually hire you guys to create effectively ad content for them, scripting, producing, and I don't know if you run the ads or not. No. So not. you provide them with the, the ads. Correct. So why that as a model? Like why did you guys create a business doing that? So to put it in context, so like not starting at the beginning of beginning, but. Um, Which by the way, CB, CBO, what, what, what's your title? Uh, I'm just a visionary now. And CEO. Yeah. yeah, CEO integrator. So yeah. Tyler Stevens, or on LinkedIn, it says CBO. 
Or CCO. CCO, yeah, yeah. Chief Creative Officer. Yeah, I haven't changed it on LinkedIn that much. Kind of shows how much I go on. Just a visionary. <laughs> yeah. Period. Yeah, I passed that off to someone that can do it better than me now. So. <laughs> okay. Um, but, um, but yeah, so when we were in e-commerce, we were creating all our own ads. So my background's in like uh, content creation, photography, videography, and stuff. So then we, me and Cody met at the beginning. We uh, got into e-commerce, and I was creating all the content. So fast forward a little bit. We are in between brands and we decided to start the agency. So when we first started the agency, we we're making performance video ads. Same thing we're doing now, um, just a little bit less niche. We're pretty broad, working with a lot of different companies, you know, some personal brands. And then we started doing media buying as well. We we're already good at media buying, so we decided to bring it on. So at that point, we were good at media buying or okay at media buying and okay at content. Then about a year ago, we decided to double down on just the content. So we niched down like hyper-focused and now we're um, really probably have like pretty like one of the top like players in the space when it comes to like the brand equity established like directly in performance video content. So niching down allows us to one charge more. Um, we have more brand equity and uh, our systems are just hyper-focused on this one thing. And everything that we do is just very detailed and um, it opens up all these different product lines and uh, different delivery vehicles of how we can sell what we're doing and stuff like that. For you guys, what's the structure on creating winning ads where a brand or a, a individual that's trying to grow a brand, is there a formula or is it luck? I mean, it's a bit of a sequence, okay? So the very first thing that you want to figure out is like, what are the winning frameworks that I can continue to pump content through? So a framework is a uh, proven sequence of elements that occur one after the other. And once you have a framework, then you can very easily plug in new uh, angles, offers, try a different demographic. So that's pretty much the order is like you want to establish your frameworks. And then from there, you can begin to test angles, offers, or demographics in a very easy to digest, you know, version. If I'm selling some kind of product, mm -hmm. what is that, that one, two, three? Right. So like, um, what's, what's your guys, um, what's the product like genre of your biggest client right now? Our biggest client is, uh, CPG. So mushroom coffee, that's our oh, biggest cool. partner right now. Cool. So we're creating over 150 original brand new video ads for them a month. Wow. So, uh, 150 ads a month. So yeah. Not like variation. Month, original yeah. pieces. Yeah. yeah. Completely new angles. New. Ads. So, so, so what you mean is like, it's not a, it's not ten videos with a different three second hook. Yeah, Correct. it's one hundred and fifty so different videos. Yeah, yeah, that's insane. Yeah, yeah. So that's where um, when it comes to like frameworks and stuff like that, we we're constantly testing frameworks. So probably every month we're testing between ten and twenty new frameworks. And then basically once we can get that framework winning across you know say five partners and we can support at least like five hundred thousand dollars of ad spend behind it, that's when we determine it to be like a winning framework. And then when we bring in like a new partner, say, you know, we bring on Fiji water, for example, um, we kind of already have not sponsored, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but say Fiji water, we already kind of have like the top, you know, 15, 20 frameworks that'll work very well with F Fiji water, a CPG brand where we already have a lot of data and stuff mm. like that. So we start out with those frameworks, cast a wide net of those different styles, and then we start doubling down on what is working. Got it. That makes sense. So w when we're talking about creating that kind of content, 150 videos for one brand, um, you know, we're looking at a social media era right now where like content is becoming, it is becoming very saturated and, and everyone and their mom and their dog wants to be a creator. And it's like this, we really have the, it is, we are in the creator economy, but it's becoming harder and harder to, to create content and stand out. How, how are you guys looking at it where you're taking one pro one product one brand and able to create that much stuff around it i mean that would go into something that tyler created it's an eight step ideation flow chart um it's pretty wicked i mean he created it so i think you should probably speak on it more yeah so to highlight it like so to put this in the context a little bit more like we only shoot performance video ads so we only do ads or videos that are getting paid ad spend behind it we don't do like organic content so our strategy is a little bit more geared towards uh you know that kind of stuff um like selling and direct response and stuff like that um so inside of the flow chart it's basically you write a bunch of direct response headlines about a product about a brand um you brainstorm a bunch of different direct response principles and how that could be related to the product and the brand um, we do this thing called cross-industry iteration, which is essentially looking at um, 
like a lot of people just look at their competitors for inspiration or, you know, other people doing similar things. But what we do is essentially we take the core avatar and you look into adjacent industries. So say, uh, you know, someone drinking Fiji water, they're also, you know, say me home delivery, meal home delivery company or something. So we're looking over in ho meal home delivery company, those top brands and taking inspiration from over there and then innovating it over into a new industry called cross industry iteration, similar to like the blue ocean, red ocean strategy, red ocean, blue ocean, but same thing. And then, um, so these, these, these eight independent steps that we're doing, and then we fuse all those things together. And that's how we come up with ideas essentially. Mm. Do you have someone on your team who's paid just to be like an idea person? Every, so all of our creative strategists, which are essentially the visionaries of our teams, they're the ones coming up with ideas. So we got like four or five of those people on our team that are coming up with ideas every week. What's the dynamic? So you said visionary, did you guys create this company together? Did you partner at some point through the journey? Like what's that look like? We met back in college. I actually met him at uh, a homecoming party. You know, we were getting all messed up and he was filming and shooting did the mustache exist at the time no it didn't <laughs> okay um, That's but, the, but his nickname was beard yeah i've had the oh, nickname really? yeah. uh, evil beard since like high school was it it was still pointy with the the yeah. lines on the side yeah uh in high school i didn't have enough going on up here to have the lines <laughs> but uh, you know i just had the goatee so then the mustache you just like laid upside down for a while and now that's why it sticks up a long time yep and then i got to straighten it too do you straightly straighten it yeah i have to huh yeah hairspray straighten it yeah kind of sucks it's like a mega protein uh, not as fun as it looks but um yeah anyway so i met him and i had just started my own first company at that time and i needed a videographer and so that's how we connected we started working together and we ended up you know working really well together that's when we got into e-com and now so fast forward so we did end up starting vizcap you know uh, as partners and so he is the visionary you know he's fantastic with ideas um very good with ideas tons of them and then I'm... You're good. gearing up to say, but he sucks at execution? No, no, <laughs> yeah. no, no. Um, I can't wrap my head around it very well. <laughs> uh, really? I mean, like, I think I'm good at it sometimes, and then I end up sucking at it, and I'm like, that's why we got, like, I mean, that's why we're partners. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm good at creating systems, operations, and implementing of those ideas. Mm. Yeah. Now, a lot of people think there's a, a misconception, or maybe, it's, maybe it is real. Like, there's this idea that... Uh, partnerships are, are never work out. Uh, how do you guys stand to that opinion? I think it's always going to come down to like communication and alignment of the end vision. So as long as those two things can stay in place and at the core, you have somebody who's a good person. I don't see any reason why they should not work out. I mean, it's a limiting belief because I mean, you can only do so much by yourself. So 100%. I mean, you're going to have to work at some people at like, I mean, if you have board of directors, like, I mean, once you get past a certain size, like you're going to have people around you that, um, you know, have like stake in what you own, you know? So, you know, like you're better off like finding people that are, you know, good at the things that you're not and, you know, building friendships with them, with them and, uh, you know, becoming like partners and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could do way more together than we could separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, me and him have the relationship where like we could get in an argument and then as soon as like we come to a resolution of the argument like it's done mm. we may get heated during the argument but as soon as the resolution has come to its place we're done mm. we move on shake hands love you because we want the best in either way we just may have different ideas about what the correct way about you know going about it is do you guys have a uh, defining like one of you it has the final say no i think I mean, it's going to come down to like two things. It'll come down to the department, like who's in charge of the department, um, or really what we always want to come down to is like what decision makes most sense. It doesn't really matter. What's logical? Yeah. What's the most logical? I'm mega logical, mm. uh, very unemotional. Um, sometimes he's like, stop acting like a fucking robot. Like, put some emotion into it. <laughs> but, well, yeah, uh, yeah. But I mean, you can't like, you can't question facts. You know what I mean? Facts right. are facts. And, uh, I mean, the book, uh, Rocket Fuel, where um, it goes over to visionary integrator roles, like, I mean, that helps establish it as well. You know, visionary comes up with a lot of ideas, then the integrator, you know, picks which ones should be integrated and when. So, mm. I mean, you know, uh, having that thing, like those things established from the start is uh, how you can kind of like eliminate any of those problems ever coming up. And what's your stance on that? Uh, when it comes to partnerships, yeah. So I, I think that uh, I agree when you say there's a uh, there's a high degree of uh, separation of responsibility, and it helps to have people on your team that are 
uh, our partners. Now, here's the thing. It's great until it's not great. Of course. And uh, I don't know the structure, but in a 50-50 partnership, it, uh, what happens is there's this thing called gridlock, mm-hmm. which is legally speaking, if there's no decision, there, you, there's no way to get out of it. Right. So there should, technically speaking, always be one person who has a higher percentage, even if it's just a fraction of a percent, um, and the decision making, dis- and that's the decision making person. Um, and in the event something were to go awry, that person could be the decision maker. But I'm all for making money with friends. I'm all for making money with people that you care about. And it's it's a lot more fun to have people that have we have a, a shared vision and goal for the company than something that's just like, you know, a bunch of employees. Mm-hmm. I agree. Completely. Um, you know, we believe like something we want to do is like put in an ESOP because we believe like the people who put in sweat equity are just as important as the people who put in a financial stake into the company, you know? Mm. So like in any regards, like, so we have 35 um and a half, 30, uh, technically 32 and a half percent each, uh, four other people have two and a half. And then, um, our founding partners, uh, have a minority stake, Brandon and Justin of Javi coffee. Um, they've got 12 and a half each. Um, and so, I mean, at the end of the day, dude, if we hit our goals and we sell for like what we expect to, uh, what am I going to do with all that money? Yeah. C- a couple hundred the- grand, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I believe that the people that are on the team and have helped build it, like, deserve a part of it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. I, I, you know, we have, a, I have an ESOP in place, too. Um, not as generous as you guys uh, uh, as far as the distribution of of equity. But um, I do know that it, we were just having this conversation uh, before about this idea of being self-made. And a lot of people think it's, like, cool to be self-made. But that's like one of the biggest lies that's holding society back. Because the thing is, is now you're basically telling everyone, you got to do it yourself. And if you don't, that you, you're not cool. Mm-hmm. And so the thing is, is look at any every single great person in the world. There was someone or something like Apple. Steve Jobs was the face, but Steve Wozniak was the, the guy who created the stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so if you, if you break it down, powerful people always had powerful partnerships. And I think that really is... A secret to success but um but people don't really recognize that it's something it's just not as cool to say oh yeah me and these 10 people did it <laughs> one of the goals that i've always had like since we started was that i want to build something fantastic with people that i actually enjoy and love being around you know it it feels like it would probably be a lot like less fun to do with like people <laughs> that you're just like oh hey bob the, the vision, so you did mention se- selling. Is that the thing? It's like, hey, we want to build something to exit? Absolutely, yep. Um, so we're building uh, a software right now, and so we'll restructure the company so that we can get a SaaS multiple. And so four years from now, we want to do um, 35 million EBITDA at a 15X multiple for 225. Okay, Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, it's good. I mean, it's cool. So six six EBITDA on a software company. I mean, that's that's actually relatively low. Fifteen x. Oh, fifteen x EBITDA on, on a software. Thirty five million. Thirty five million EBITDA at a fifteen x. Okay. Yeah. I mean, dude. Yeah. So what's the roadmap to get there? What do you have to do to ex- to execute and build that? It comes down to like the delivery vehicles. So like right now, like put in the context, like we've been making content for brands for three plus years now. We've been in the the, the, the ground running, you know, in, in the trenches making content. So we have this done for you offer that is very high ticket, you know, it goes packages range from 10,000 to, you know, $150,000 a month. But in order to scale it up, we need to incur a lot of overhead. So um, that's kind of like our bread and butter. So what we're doing there is focusing on just working with very high quality brands, brands that are, you know, keeping our finger on the pulse. And then we have info and consulting launching, the different vehicles, and then the software vehicle, which is software is the most scalable, info is the second most scalable, and then the, uh, the consulting is like the done with you offer. So now that we tapped into these other vehicles, that's how we can easily scale up, you know, to those like, like that higher EBITDA and stuff. So. From the roadmap standpoint, is uh, we're we've launched our SaaS a couple months ago. Here we have a roadmap to finish it uh, by the end of the year, pretty much, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So finish version, developing. Yeah. Um, so version one, which is going to be a pretty rudimentary uh, version, beta's already out. It's been out for a couple months, but 
Um, I mean, that one's like super uh, limited in terms of like what is available. Um, we have more internally that we're using with it. That will be released in version one, uh, and then there'll be like two more versions to get it all out by the end of the year. And then obviously, you know, you got to continue to improve on it. We have, you know, uh, like a year and a half or more worth of like features that we want to continue to roll out on it. Um, and we should be able to expedite it, but right now, since the software isn't bringing in like a significant amount of revenue, we only dedicate you know a proportionate amount of resources to it. Do you have a? Uh, do you talk about? And and maybe this isn't something you talk about, but uh, do you have a dev team? Uh, are you using an agency? Yep. Um, so we have um, three main people on the dev team right now, uh, and so we just brought in Greg Greg Woodfield. He is one of the founders of Via Customers. Uh, Via Customers, I mean, went from zero to like $350 million valuation in like a year and a half, a uh, SaaS company. So we just brought him on as a consultant uh, to really help us like navigate the SaaS space uh, because it's not what we do. So like we're content creators. We know that we'll be able to create a badass SaaS product, but actually getting him He's been there. He's done that. So, and so he's not one of the three. He is not. And so, the three, the three people are devs, or uh, so two are devs. One is like the team lead, uh, and then um, yeah, Greg that we just brought on. And then, yeah, like next week we're running on quality assurance as well as like uh, designer now as yeah. well. So, so actually in the next week, like the team will grow like three more people. Uh, but as of currently, yeah. What's the so with software? So first, so so SaaS software as a service. Um, it's it's kind of like almost like the new agency revolution. It's yep. so like agencies mm-hmm. was like a, devel- a development, and you have an agency, I have an agency, um, but selling software is cool because one, you can get way higher multiples. Mm-hmm. Like if you told a typical business person the multiples you get on software, they're like they think you're living in unicorn land. Right. But but it's there. Um, it's way more scalable, way more profitable, like all the benefits of it. And so building software, but the problem with that is like building software is hard. So I also have a software company. It's called Agency Box. We cater, our product is specifically designed for agency owners. And uh, I've spent two and a half years building a product and a product I'm happy to say exists was released a month ago. Yeah. All previous versions I wouldn't call software. Yeah. They were web apps. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I heard, uh, I think it was like Patrick Beck David or maybe Hermosi, they're like, you know, whatever you think your um, necessary budget and timeline is going to be for a software company, like two to three exit. And we've pretty much seen the same thing. Like at the beginning, dude, we really like fumbled and fucked up, but um, we've gotten things straightened out, you know, um, but it's difficult. I think the other piece of it too is like the... Um like, uh, like, how can you, like, launch MVPs to make it, like, so, like, all of our info stuff, we used to do info stuff on, like, Kajabi and stuff. Now we built an LMS, like, into our software. So now we're driving uh, all these lead gen campaigns for free users to, you know, our free info products as well as all the people that are paying for our info products is now inside of our, like, our ecosystem of VizCap AI. So it's all on the same platform. So we're getting a bunch, acquiring a bunch of free users, and then you know trying to upsell them to the paid version or consulting or done for you content. Um, and then once we start le- releasing these other features, we already have a bunch of like free users there, kind of. So it's not where we want it to be, but um, you know we're we're building the ecosystem at the same time. So it's not like we're going to be taking a step back or anything, which is cool. How many users do you have in the ecosystem? Not much. Free ones? Um, like a couple hundred or thousands? Oh, or? Lord, you're being generous. I don't know. Like 20? No, yeah. I'd probably say free users. I mean, I've drew, I mean, probably oh, at least five yeah. or 600. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the education, the free education shit. Uh, on beta, though, 20. So you're, basically what you're, what you're using is you're using the education as a lead magnet to get mm-hmm. people into the s- potential future software programs. Yeah. But you built out effectively your own course ecosystem where you can watch courses inside of the software exactly. so that you can exactly. have upsells people can click on the stuff and yeah. see all the other yeah yeah plus we're tacking on like info products onto like the paid software too so you know it's beta it's not the best software right now people got to work with us so you know the main thing we're selling is like the info too so like you know like you don't just get a glitchy software 
like being a beta user, like you get all these info products too. So kind of uh, helps us like get paid users feedback too, as we're like building, because you know, that's what we need. We need people that are using it, um, giving us feedback on the software as well. What's the product that the software does? The one, uh, so the one that we're building, it'll be basically like a full suite of content creation tools. Uh, the primary thing will be the storyboards. And so taking a little bit like, taking it back for context, all of the content that we make is modular content. And so what that means is when you look at a video, it's not just a video. It's mm. made up of individual pieces. Think of it as a, uh, a recipe to, you know, or an ingredient to a recipe, okay? And so you have your hook, you have your product intro, you have your authority, you have your guarantee, um, CTA. Those are all elements, okay? And so each one of those pieces is assembled individually when the ad is created. So they stand alone, okay? And so that is done with our storyboarding process, which then when you go to create variations, everything is tagged and searchable from the storyboard. Mm -hmm. So you can very easily search and find the clips that you want for new variations. And it'll be fed by data, which will tell you like this hook here has the highest probability to put into this ad mm. for a greater lift in performance. Or this product intro has been this many winning ads. You should use it here. Okay. And so that's the main thing that will be accomplished. And we'll also have casting um, as a part of it, project management as well. And from like a higher level even, um, like the reason people work with us like at all is because of our like our IP and stuff like that. Like um, we're pretty, uh, probably the most expensive like in the marketplace when it comes to like what we do, but the IP and the data and the systems that we have are what people are actually paying us for, the clients that we're working with and stuff like that. The finger on a pulse that we have across multiple different industries. So someone's paying us, you know, multiple, you know, say 30 grand a month for video ads for their brand you know, not every brand can do that. Mm -hmm. So how can they access that IP on different levels? So building our systems into a software where you can pretty much do exactly what we do using our systems, using our IP, but do it on your own. Like it opens up the door to, you know, giving brands that, you know, can't work with us like that opportunity and stuff. So what I could basically do in the future product is we could shoot an ad. We'd have the, the, the hook, we would have the next thing, the next thing, next thing, call to action, whatever, and end cards. And I can have ten of different variations and basically mix and match the different the different parts. Yep. And then there'll be data behind the scenes. It's like this hook performs best, this call to action performs best. Mm -hmm. And you effectively could create the best AI driven ad of the different segments. Yeah. That's cool. Correct. Yeah. Really cool. So as it stands today, uh, if I were to use the tool, what do I get? You know, I know it's beta, right? We've said this yeah. 10 times, but what, what, do I, what am I able to use? At its current standpoint, we have, um, so I mentioned the frameworks before. So we've taken all of the data from, uh, and all of the copy storyboards from the fr winning frameworks, and we've created models off of them so that you can do AI um, copy based off of the framework after you plug in your product or you know information about your brand. Mm. And then it'll spit out a script and a storyboard based off of our most winning uh, frameworks and ads. Hmm. Got it. So say you cool. want to make a UGC demo framework for Fiji water, you put in your brand information for Fiji water using our like get who to buy framework and then it takes the the top performing scripts of that framework that you know we've spent you know, uh, you know, five hundred thousand dollars plus of ad spend behind, and then it models that and builds uh, a script around like your product. Mm. So, yeah, cool. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. Like, it's a good like you know home base, but like, um, it was just something to get it like out in the marketplace and stuff. Um, it's not anywhere near. It's like the f like the first step of like ten steps that the software will be. If that makes sense. On the development of software, right? There's a lot of people that will look and be like, I want to build a software company. And you guys are you guys saw that and you're moving towards that. What could you s expect someone to have to pay to have like, even a small dev team like what you guys have on a monthly basis? Like, how expensive is it? Um, probably like I mean, ten grand a month. I mean, you could easily start off for us. I mean, like uh, I think that's like right where we're around right now. So it's so part of our team is like in uh, um, like overseas and stuff like that too. So. Um, not the best person. Like in ask. Canada or? No, like. <laughs> <laughs> Is that overseas? <laughs> yeah. Um, Mex uh, like, uh, like, like Bahamas, like overseas? No, like uh, nice. Eastern Europe and stuff. So nice, we have yeah. like, uh, like um, 
person out there that hooks us up and stuff. So we're not probably a good people to ask. So I mean, like like I said, like like cont- like agency world, like agency operations, we're like level ten. Like our our, our systems are about as optimized as they could get right now. But when it comes to software team or software d- business development, we're on like level one or two, you know? Mm. So we're still learning. So, <laughs> How so about do, you? So yeah, dude. So um, my stuff is I saw the writing on the wall and I, I, I see it in the future. And so there's two things. One, if I have like 5,000 people that are partners of ours at Agency Box, people that use my software or people that uh, have, uh, that use our info products as well. Right? We, have, we also have LMS inside of our, uh, software nice. and so uh for them i'm like these are all agency earners every single one of them and what's going to happen is happening is there's marketing is becoming automated and it will become more and more automated so how can i continue to serve and support my community most of them don't have the knowledge or the ability to build automated marketing solutions so i i'm building it for them so we have a tool that you can do press releases uh, instantly using AI nice. where a marketing agency owner could sell press to clients and get them featured 20 minutes later with just a few clicks of a button. So, um, we have a full CRM we built out data. You can actually get, we have like 300 million data, uh, like verified emails and phone numbers inside our system for people to get agency owners to get the leads. And then we have email campaign tool where they can actually email like blast like thousands and thousands of people through our tools too to contact the leads to get them to sign up so we built out what the little things i wish existed when i was running my agency and um and so i have a eight person dev team we have the way we structure it is i have um one guy who's the team lead he oversees it uh he oversees the designer we have a devops guy so DevOps, the guy, uh, he's responsible basically for the hosting of the platform, overseeing AWS on Amazon. When there's domain issues, he, he handles all that. It's a full-time job because in a proper software development company uh, process, you basically have three different pipelines of development. You have the where the developers build stuff and break it every single day. Le- uh, level two is staging, which is like where a CEO or founder would watch staging and they'd they'd live there and they would see everything operating from that p- point of view and play around. And then you have production, which is the live environment that users are using. Mm-hmm. And so most companies, they try to build on production, but it's just breaking, users can't use it. So developers, you build on dev, founders get a test shit in, produ- in uh, staging. So he manages all that. And then I've got designer, and then we've got uh, tech lead, and then I've got four developers under that. So what five, I'm actually eight what, eight or nine people on my dev team. And building that took an incredibly long process. Cool. I used agencies, I used freelancers, I used guys in Eastern Europe. And it wasn't until I figured out a simple solution to be able to build a dev team where I actually went and found, I found these guys who built a half a billion dollar company wow. off software. And I basically convinced them to give me their, the guys who built their platform, show me all the systems and install everything for me in exchange for, basically like just like a handshake and a hug <laughs> these guys just want to see me succeed beautiful and so um now we're developing features like like this mm-hmm. and um we're supporting our community by doing it that's nice. incredible yeah yeah so question for you um do you think for an agency do you think uh welcome to the VizCat podcast where we <laughs> answer questions about building <laughs> yeah. no uh, uh, but um is it about diversifying services or doubling down on a single service like what we talked about here and uh changing the delivery vehicle so dude for agency model i think the the core thing for success is having a, a winning offer it's like what you do, what you sell, and your value to the marketplace. So for you guys, you make video ads. Like <laughs> it's pretty dang clear. Mm-hmm. If someone wants to buy the highest and quality uh, video ad company, they know who to go to. But for those people out there that are selling, you know, a little bit of everything, like y- you're gonna get lost in this in the shuffle. Mm-hmm. And even if someone wants to buy from you, they don't know how. Yeah. So that's my thoughts. What about you? Um, I would agree. It depends on like where you're at and stuff like that. For us, like, um, like we try to diversify and, uh, it just made us like less, it devalued us and stuff like that. 
um, when we were good at one really good thing the whole time, and we should have just doubled down on that. And then now I kind of see how we can get to where we need to go by just changing the delivery vehicle, info, software, consulting, um, off of our core offer and stuff like that. But I think if someone is in a different position, you know, um, where they don't have something that's winning, um, but they have good clients, good paying clients, example, like local agencies, potentially something like that, diversifying like the services is like the best way to go. So I guess it depends on the business model industry, you know, where the business is too. Agency Box originally started as a white label service for provider. Nice. So we had hundreds of people come through and just buying agencies, buying my services, reselling it. And then we added education, info products, and we added software. Now, uh, that being said, one of the things we do, it's like agency owner, this guy knows how to build websites, doesn't know how to run ads, do social media management. He comes to us and then we do the, we do that side of the business for him. Right. So uh, I think if you can, it's really hard to expand and scale as like a solopreneur or a small team because you're going to, you know, you're going to sell a service you don't even know how to provide mm-hmm. or you're going to have to pay someone some extreme amount of money to do it. But if you can find partnerships or some kind of, you know, something like what we do, we can work with someone and they can do the fulfillment for you and you can just run the business as a CEO. That's how I would expand my service offering. Does that make sense? No, it makes total sense. We've we've done it before. Um, I mean, we've done white label stuff uh, in the past with uh, you know people that white labeled us and stuff like that, um, where we would shoot the video content for their clients and stuff, and we would just be in the background, you know, doing it all. Um, depends on who you are. You know, it's a good place to start and stuff. But I think owning your team and stuff uh, is the best way. It just you know, I think that's the long-term solution and stuff like that, but I don't know. What do you guys do for client acquisition? What's your mode of getting customers? So Stage speaking. Yeah, that's the On stage speaking? One. Yeah. That, like, that's it. hands down. That's it. Hmm. That's all we do. Twitter, too. Pretty much it. I mean. That loosely. Barely. So how do you get on stages? Um, Having a sick mustache? <laughs> Uh, it's maybe gotten me some stages. You can't speak, dude. You're yeah. just like a little peach fuzz. He's got, <laughs> he's got the... No, I'm just joking. Um, so going back to like even further, when we had done e-com, we did well at it. We joined a... Um, we joined the war room. Uh, Ryan Dice's, uh, Perry Belch, Roland Frazier's their mastermind. And, I was uh, just in Cabo at Founders Board uh, yeah. like two weeks ago. Roland, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, he's a G. And Ryan. Ryan Dice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, so we made an, uh, an incredible network uh, from being a part of the War Room. And so that's where we met Brandon, Justin, our partner. Brandon is mega connected to everybody. And so he introduced us to Nick Shackelford. Mm-hmm. And um, Nick gave us a chance to speak. And the first time <laughs> I, um, I got to speak at his event, I go on stage and I'm like, Poosh. I'm wearing a fucking space suit, okay? <laughs> oh, what? And I'm like, who's ready to take their content to the moon? <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was pretty terrible. But um, You really wore a space suit? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. 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 You guys got to send me a video of that. It's like, like hilarious. Like dude. early, like 2020, dude, it was right before COVID. Literally yeah. right as COVID. That was the COVID space suit. <laughs> yeah, this yeah, is yeah. how you stayed safe during COVID. <laughs> exactly. Was the space suit. Yep, yep. And um, anyways. And how many calls did you get after that? Uh, zero. Oh, it didn't work? No, no, no. It didn't work. It was terrible. <laughs> I mean, it was the first time I ever spoke. But, um, you know, we were uh, lucky enough. I mean, Nick's a fantastic guy. We're best friends now. He gave me another chance uh, to speak. And so. Did he know you were going to come in a space suit? He had no idea. Oh, my God. Was he yeah. pissed? Um, you know, he wasn't pleased for sure because everybody else was like walking up on the stage. And I was like, uh-uh. I need to come in from the back, so it's yeah. a surprise. <laughs> Only dude, yeah. Well, we speak. Was well, that your speak. idea as the visionary? No, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, that was all his. Anyways, from there, um, we speak at all of his events. I like, what is glazing over this? This is like the, the most ex- like like yeah. coolest thing. Do you still have the spacesuit? Can is it, is it rental? I or? still have the spacesuit. Dude, you you yeah. should be doing that on every single stage you speak. This on. was like an Amazon spacesuit. This wasn't like a yeah yeah special. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it's it's like a Halloween costume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, it's good yeah. though. It's good. Yeah, it was great, dude. And this um, is pre mustache too. So <laughs> yeah, like, as the ego got bigger, was speaking on stages, the mustache got bigger. Yeah. <laughs> um, but being a part of his Geek Out event, uh, that built us the brand equity to then have other people ask us to 
you know, speak on their stage, and it's pretty much just snowballed from, you know, you get one stage, they see it, they give you another stage, and yeah. Doesn't that make your your client acquisition, like, very dependent on almost, like, other people? It did at the beginning very much so, yeah. And, um, you know, when, when we first started and we hadn't really built up brand equity, you know, if we didn't have an event, it'd be like, we can nurture these leads for, like, I don't know, a month, month and a half. And it's like after that, it's like, man, when is the next event coming? Mm. We need more leads. Yeah. Um, but now they just like roll in. Yeah, a lot of inbound leads always rolling in because, um, I mean, we've been attached to Geek Out and like these other events for close to like three years now and stuff like that. So um, really like uh, there's all these event recordings floating around. We have the event recordings to use as marketing material. So like pretty much every sales call that I hop on now, like, like people already know who we are. They know who VizCap is. So we don't really have to sell like what we do. We just need to see if there's a right fit and manage expectations and stuff. Like a lot of the time I just send them a folder of like our event recordings to look over our systems and stuff like that. So like, um, yeah, I mean. So, so when you go to an event, right? Let's say, let's say like back a little bit before you just had this waterfall of people coming to you all the time begging to work with you, you know, back in the early days. Um, what, what did, did you have a booth there? Like, how did you get people's information and these leads to work? Just a lead magnet on the presentation. Okay, so like QR a QR codes. code that could yeah. scan to get uh, info product or something, like yep. the, the three-page the manifesto. On. Yeah, yeah. Um, whatever we did we giveaways. We tested giveaways. Um, the last event that, the last geek out we did was in May, and we did uh, free uh, users of the software and stuff. So. Mm. What's been the best lead magnet for on stage? Um, it changed. So, I mean, the giveaway hit pretty hard. Like, we had, yeah. back when we did Geek Out Ukraine over in Europe, we spoke in Ukraine right before the war started. That's where you found and your dev team. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. But, um, so that's, so we got, like, over, like, 150 signups, like, at that event. Mm. Um, uh, Opt-ins. Yeah. Opt-ins. Opt-ins. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, if people are raising their hand for a giveaway, does that, are they lower quality potential customer or well you'd think so but when the room is already so high quality Mm. it's pretty much like the like that's the other part is like geek out is probably the biggest event when it comes to like e-commerce brands like everyone there is you know spending at least 200 300 thousand dollars a month on ads so you know like oh, got people cool. spending millions of dollars a month what was the giveaway like a free a free package like yeah, free, free, yeah. Free, free, free like ten thousand dollar content package oh dude so you're getting people that want your stuff that that want at content mm-hmm. uh, opting yeah. in for it's not like uh you know someone's opting in to get a free iphone or something yeah <laughs> yeah no, that's cool that's good it's good strategy so um, once so once people are inside your ecosystem, they're now a lead. How do you guys turn those interested people into buyers? Yeah, so um, we need to do it a lot better. We don't have an email list. We don't have any of that, uh, unfortunately. Um, something we need to do more of. But uh, it's surprising we've made it this far with how little like marketing. Actual sales I'm hearing you guys and- say this stuff. I'm like, you're like everything I ask you. You're like, you know, I know we're doing it all wrong. Yeah, but you guys are still. C- kicking ass like yeah. how the heck are you guys doing this i really think it comes down to our systems dude like we don't even really sell people like much on like oh our content's going to get you this this and this it's like here's how we're going to do it and no other creative agency out there is like actually like telling people hey here's what's going to happen on this day this day and this day they're just like uh yeah you'll get some ads and mm-hmm. it'll be great and so they're part of the process yeah and so like when we were in ecom, we ended up spending like 8K on a video from this uh, company that I'm not going to bash them, um, say their name, but um, total fucking disaster. It's called Vayner Media. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, <laughs> goddamn you. Um, dude, it was a total disaster. And so, like, we kind of took that, like, terrible experience and understood that, like, when it comes to working with a client on the opposite end, you know, of where we were, um, you just need to understand what the hell is going to happen. Hmm. Yeah. And I mean, the other part of it too, is like understanding that, uh, I mean, every business like isn't perfect and stuff like that. So how can you make, especially from an agency model, you know, things go wrong, projects are late, you know, you know, projects get behind and stuff like that. And for us, we tried to build out like our systems to be as consistent at like make the product as consistent as possible. So a lot of agencies use like creators and send the product off to like creators and stuff like that. But 
creators aren't marketers. They're, they, they're, they're creative people. So like they don't, they're not going to follow the systems you put in place. They're going to add their own vision twist to the video and stuff like that. But we're making ads. So we shoot with actors like in person, actually. Mm. So not a lot of agencies, maybe like a, less than a handful, probably less than like three agencies, like do what we do and shoot in person with actors and have their creative strategists and directors still on set and stuff like that. So that's a huge selling point there because the product is consistent every single time. You, you really aren't a just like an ad agency. You're like a production company that creates commercials, but in the modern era where it's they get posted on social media through ads. Through yeah. Ads. Yeah. I mean, we're definitely more of like a marketing agency than a production company. Um, but, but you're creating the content, right? Yeah. No, we are. And that's what we were before. But um, it's. Like we're very data driven, so I mean, like, um, not like, just geeks with cameras. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'd say like the thing that like me personally I'm most passionate about is like systematizing like creativity. Like I don't think creativity like belongs in marketing really at all. Like I think like um, you know working in like these constraints inside of like certain systems is how you can really be creative like in marketing and mm. stuff like that. So, uh, but most creative agencies they just come up with all these crazy ideas and stuff, but like. Uh, I mean, that's not what you need. So instead, you should be looking at, like, it's not ego of, like, I want to make a cool ad because it looks cool. It's like, I know this is gonna the winning this winning formula, like, and, and, and you go you operate from that. Well, from that as well as, you know, analyzing data, you know, I mean, you've got to remove opinions, emotions from it. It's all based all off logic, what we do and stuff like that. So, so you'll analyze your client's data? Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. You can't create performance creatives without analyzing their performance. What are the metrics that go into uh, create it that you track as far as ads? Um, so, I mean, that's a loaded question. Like you, you should be looking at a, a large number of different things, uh, but you would begin by looking at like, what is the North Star metric for that specific client? North Star metric for different, for clients could be a CPL, CPA, or ROAS depending. And then from there, uh, you would want to begin if you're going to be creating a uh, variation, for instance, um, and you want to optimize it so you can scale um, horizontally, meaning you want to replicate your winning ad by making simple changes to it. Mm. You would look at the metric that is underperforming, so it's called a dependent variable. The dependent variable are your metrics, uh, CPC, CTR, and they're impacted by independent variables, the elements inside of your ads, the hook, the product intro, authority, so on and so forth. And so let's say CPC is an underperforming dependent variable. We would then go, okay, the average watch time is... 15 seconds. What element can I change in this ad that would impact CPC before 15 seconds? And you're just doing that based off opinion. I think this is going to be it. Or like, you know, based on the ads we ran, if we put a hotter chick here, you know, it's going to perform better. Correct. And so it's not art, it's science. And science is built off of uh, hypothesis and conclusions. So each time we make a decision and change something, it's backed by a hypothesis we believe x is going to happen because of y Mm. and so then we uh, analyze the data form a conclusion and continue to build that database of conclusions and hypothesis that will then help us make the decisions much more effectively Mm. that's cool really cool um what uh what role does uh gender have when it comes to ads that produce well girls fucking crush really for sure girls babies pets typically yep. for most brands. So yeah. So wait, like, you're saying girls, babies, pets. So, so it has to be a girl that has a baby and you use the pet. No, like <laughs> typically like, like joking. everyone loves girls. Girls yeah, love like girls. Guy love girls. Uh, everyone you didn't loves follow babies, the chain there. You baby, said girls, right? babies, pets. So it sounded yeah. like you were referring to pets that are <laughs> oh, no. the baby's pet. <laughs> so guys look at girls, girls look at girls and babies. Okay. And, and cute dogs. Sure. Of course. Absolutely. No one um, likes cats. I've got cats. <laughs> you like and cats. I think they're Guys with mustaches like cats. Yeah, they're low in maintenance. For a coffee brand or something, you know, uh, that isn't like super male predominant, let's say like a survival, like a guy's going to perform better in survival or uh, car detailing. Mm. Hot chicks don't work because the uh, it's not real. prospect. Exactly. They're like, what credibility do you have? Yes. You just got a big old fucking fat pair of titties that I'm looking <laughs> at and you don't know <laughs> dick about what you're talking about. And so... Obviously, you know, in that scenario, use a male. Uh, but for a lot of the other brands, like females generally produce higher than males. 
Yeah, and I want to say this. What if a too, man has a fat pair of titties? Could he, could that perform well? Uh, if we're talking about like bras for men, maybe <laughs> potentially. Is that one of your clients? Brasformen.com. <laughs> uh, could be. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was gonna say. <laughs> just, lost my he's thinking time. about that man titties. Yeah, he's like he's, he, he sees them. He's like, like just, just thinking uh, about the barrel. Just pull, pull the pull, uh, just pull the shirt a little wider. There we go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Ten <man>. million views. <laughs> uh, no, but I was gonna say uh, like. Like what we're doing isn't uh, like um, like I mean we can't take the credit for it. Like direct response advertising has been around for you know 40, 50, 60 years. Like and we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just taking what has the core psychological triggers of like why people buy. And we're just leveraging it in a different medium. Like it started with print advertising, then it went to radio and then TV, and then now it's just on social. And this new UGC style content medium is just like the new medium of communication. Mm. So we're taking these principles that have been around for a very long time and just applying them in a different way, you know? Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, uh, you know, w one thing on, on the client retention, keeping them happy, we spoke on this. There's one thing I did want to add, which was um, the one thing that changed my agency was when I realized clients care less about the result and more about the communication. It's like the weirdest thing. Mm -hmm. Like you could literally do nothing for them, but if you email them every week and say, hey, just want to give you an update, nothing's been done. Like they would stay with you for like probably like two or three months, even if you didn't do anything, if you just weekly told them, hey, like haven't started yet, we'll start soon, yeah. which is the craziest thing because if you're getting amazing results for them, but you don't communicate with them, they'll be done. They won't be paying next month. That was one of the things that like, we had experience when we worked with that company previously uh, that we got the video from. So very early on, uh, it was a requirement of our account managers to communicate with them every single day, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. Mm. Here's what happened. Here's what we accomplished. Here's what went wrong. Here's how we're going to fix it. When you say the video, what, what, you're referring to which one? Um, when we were still in e -com and we had hired that company. Oh, that oh got it. Yeah, yeah. They didn't communicate dick to us. Mm. And so we're like, we're hitting them up. We're like, dude, where is our video? And for us at the time, 8K was like a lot of money for a video. We were like, what? For, I mean, for anyone, it's like, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Um, communication is key, dude. They just need to know what's happening and we should always tell them before they ask. Yeah, I think it comes back to a lot of like sales things too. So I mean, like uh, with high ticket sales, like people like buy and continuously buy from people that they like and trust. So if you can build up the trust and they like you, um, like there's a good chance that they will continue buying from you. Mm. Um, so y you guys are in the world of creating content. This is your business. You run an agency and growing into a software company. But both of you guys have pretty small personal brands. Is there a, a method for a reason for that? Or you guys just haven't put attention there? We're starting right now. Yeah, yeah. this is a start. Yeah, we uh, we both started like tweeting um, a few weeks ago, uh, like consistently. Um, All right, guys, can you please go follow them? We need to get them over a thousand. You're a little higher, but yeah, he's we'll higher. go you from like 830 to like over a thousand. 330. On You're at 330? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. On uh, Twitter, on IG. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. So I'm doing a bunch of videos too. So I'll have um, three videos going out a day um, within the next week and a half. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It took me a long time to realize like um, that we should have been doing it this whole time. Yeah. Major uh, regret. Um, our partner, Brandon, that uh, I mentioned earlier, the whole time, like since we started, he's like, dude, make content, fucking make content. And you're like, I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, never heard of it. How do I do it? Um, there's a thing called storyboarding. So basically I have an eight step system and what you can do is you can go to vizcap.ai and actually sign, <laughs> sign up for my list. Sick. I've heard of those guys. <laughs> yeah. I heard the CEO is pretty cool. Yeah. Must, mustache, He's a mustache guy. guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm saying he, like, he would blow up pretty quick. Dude, right? He would. Yeah. <laughs> we got a couple clips here that that'll do well. So for sure. Um, yeah. Huge regret, dude. Like say I something controversial before you say that. Um, oh, you don't want to do that. <laughs> Uh, I'll stick it, in. Be okay, yeah, stick it in here at some point. Uh, <laughs> stick it in where? Well, mm. the back door with no lube, of course. <laughs> Brasformen.com. <laughs> yeah. Get yours today. Um, huge regret. As soon as I started like writing out tweets and being able to provide value to the community, dude, I was like, man, I should have been doing this the whole time. Like, it's very fulfilling. It's very fun because it's the ability to do what we do on stage but in a much different format and you're able to do it more constantly. And I'll tell you, like speaking on stage and 
sharing with you know people that are there is like there's no better feeling mm. yeah. yeah took me a while to get over it i was very introverted at the while a while like for a long time so i've spoken on stage like four or five times now and like i'm finally like better but at first it was like rough and i think it's the same thing with doing it you know on social and stuff but yeah have you spoken on stage yeah so the biggest audience i spoke to is about three thousand people that's uh good. There was 1,500 in person and 1,500 virtual. Yeah, that's good. Um, and then, you know, I've done, you know, a fair amount of other speaking engagements. Um, when I talk about building a personal brand, because um, that, that's really what our what our agency specializes. You guys specialize in content creation. We specialize in personal brand development. There's, there's three levels. At the bottom is authority. So you need a, what's a baseline level of social proof. I don't care if you guys believe it or not but the world operates on uh, immediate first impressions. And if you have 330 followers, people don't care. Nope. Who's this guy, why should I follow him? Mm-hmm. Uh, if there's no, no, no story, you don't have a personal brand website, you don't have press writing about you. So the foundation is you gotta establish that stuff so when someone Googles you, at least there's something there. Then from there, you gotta uh, go in and start creating content and actually creating like, who are you, what do you stand for? Oh, you're the mustache guy. Right, you're the guy that wears the purple shirt, the monster hat, has a mustache that's upside down. Like now, people start to know this guy, but at the same time, holy crap, he knows his stuff with business. Mm. He operates a company. He has all these employees. They have this exact system. And Alex Hermosi, part of the reason why Alex Hermosi, in a year and a half, no one knew who he was, and now he's like the most talked about person in business, mm-hmm. is because he's a master at marketer. It's not that he's incredibly successful. He is successful, but that's not it. The key with him is he has muscles, he wears a plaid shirt, he's got no strips on, and a big beard. Mm-hmm. You see him once, you'll never forget, and the stuff he says makes sense. Mm-hmm. You're the same thing. And then the third thing, the pinnacle of building a personal brand is tapping into other people's audiences. Yeah. Building an audience is hard. The reason Alex grew so fast is he people were sharing his stuff. He was on podcasts. He was speaking on stages. When you get in a room of 3,000 people that all paid to be there, or you're in the Ukraine and you have people spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, these are the highest quality audience. And even if one person follows you and turns into a customer, that's a huge win. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Yeah. Yeah, like how you broke that down, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So that said, um, (laughs) um, I appreciate you guys being here. Um, How can the world connect with you and, and stay in touch? Instagram, Twitter, uh, Vizcap Tyler is mine, V I S C A P Tyler. Um, I think I'm Cody Iverson. I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll just paste it down. Yeah, yeah. It'll, be, it'll be in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll paste it all down there. Yeah. And um, anything else you guys have to say or share with the world? No, appreciate it, man. Um, appreciate it. I do have um, something here. So, <clears throat> oh. this here is uh, looks like an old school book. And uh, it is a book of amazing questions. Now, when I was creating the podcast, I was like, I want to be able to have a way for my guests to be able to leave a legacy, but one that they don't necessarily know, you know, what it means. So every guest that comes on the show writes a question for the following guest to answer. And you don't know who it is. So the previous guest wrote you a question. I haven't even read it yet. You guys are going to read it, answer it, and then leave a question for the next guest. So beautiful. Oh man, I need a question. Someone asked, once said, uh, "Do you believe in aliens?" It's like, well, now everyone does, as of yesterday. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I think it's the bottom one on the right there. Hopefully, that's legible. Who is your role? Who is your role model, and why? This is from Augie Schmidt. Oh, Augie. Dude, I, yeah, you know Augie? Oh yeah, we no, we, we went to Denver. Yeah. Um, my uh, baseball coach in college, um, which I didn't play for the team, um, but uh, his name was Augie Schmidt. Uh, I'm sure it's not the same guy. Um, <laughs> Is his name really Augie Schmidt? 100%. And yeah. he's your role model? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> okay, I was going to say. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yeah, this is Augie Schmidt. <sighs> Fuckers, get to running. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, how fat was he? Uh, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't like too fat, uh, but the dude fucking smoked like a chimney. Uh, <laughs> dude, hilarious story on that is um, as I was a sophomore, we would haze the freshman baseball players. So I made this, I was in. Uh, you did that for four years in a row? 
I don't I, no, this was like a one year thing. <laughs> oh, you were only sophomore for one year. Well, of mm. course. <laughs> yeah, luckily. He was like a quadruple uh, super senior. Yeah. Oh, it was a senior year that you did four times. <laughs> um well, yeah, <laughs> correct. Um anyway, so I make this huge cutout of Augie and he's got like twenty cigs in his mouth, <laughs> and I put a beer bong through his dick. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, get on your knees, freshman head suck off his back. <laughs> Hilarious. He found out about it. I think that's why I never played. Anyway, um, who was my role model? And he was jealous of your mustache. Uh, the dude had a fucking fat calendar pillar mustache. Um, my role model was my grandpa. Um, so growing up, you know, he had his own business and. He provided a great life for me, my family, and everybody that he was around, you know, was very generous. And so that is what got me into business. I wanted to be able to provide that same sort of um, luxury and giving towards, you know, people that I care about. And so, you know, he may not have, like, taught me a lot um, in terms of, like, business. Um, I never really got to learn much from him, but... um, yeah, he was my role model and got me into business and just being a great guy. Yeah. What about you? Um, honestly, I'm trying to think. And uh, I think back to the beginning and like what, uh, you know, really got me to the point where I am now. And uh, I think it was probably everything that we learned from like Grant Cardone, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean, like the 10X rule, first book we ever read. Like, I mean, that's how we started seeing ses- success right away. That's the whole reason we moved here. We went to 10X Grove, Grove County mm. here, and then uh, we ended up moving here like a year later. So, oh. like, uh, I mean, a lot of the big decisions, a lot of the big successes were because of either things that I learned from him or, you know, because of yeah. that. So, yeah. Grant Cardone is huge. Everybody that, you know, joins the company has to read 10X. Um, also, I mean, Alex Ramosi now, I'd say he's like the person that I like look up to the most and learn and consume the most content from. Um, also a big fan of Ed Milet, Andy Frisella, uh, Tony Robbins. Yeah, those guys. Dylan Mulroney? Um, well, so this guy is really good at creating OnlyFans agencies. So absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, yeah, no. Um, Hermosi's though, like the number one person that I consume this. Yeah, days. I mean, he, he changed our business last year because I mean, a lot of the new. You know who Dylan Mulvoni is, right? That's not me. Oh, is that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh. yeah I just heard Dylan, and I was like, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, that's the the Bud yeah, Light. The, yeah, yeah. Oh light. Lord, <laughs> don't even. I heard you were a big fan. Oh, jeez, don't Louise, get him don't. going. Yeah. <laughs> I won't get into it. Oh, you can. No. no, no. Do it for the views. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, that, that's a whole nightmare. Talk about a brand blowing up, right? Like going from being like the, like the number one brand to something. I, and, and look, I, to, I'm going to give them like, I'm going to be generous when I say this. It was just someone in their team who said, hey, let's send this influencer a can of Bud Light and they send them to thousands of people. And there was no one there, you know, there was of course people saying, Hey, let's be more inclusive and all this stuff. But it's not like they sat the CEO and the, the executive team sat around the boardroom. It's like, I got an idea. Let's send one can of Bud Light to this somewhat relevant trans influencer. And the whole thing just snowballed. And it was like, you know, I, you would never predict that. You would never predict that the world would turn on them so much for that one can. But they didn't know their audience. They didn't know the demographic. And I think there's a lot of tension around this idea right now. And people are getting, you know, friction. There's, like, being taught in school this stuff. And if finally people are like, this is enough. And this was like Bud Light happened to be the, 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 the target for this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it started even a little bit earlier. Like, at least, like, for the trans thing, like, Bud Light was definitely the first. But, like, Balenciaga, too, like, they got totally fucking burned earlier. Uh, but... Like the lady who right made the decision, though, I think, right? What? I mean, wasn't that one like child shit? Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Balenciaga. Uh, yeah. Or like child labor or something or what? No, dude. Born, so think, right? um, they put out an ad campaign and it was children uh, wrapped around with a lot of like BDSM shit. And mm-hmm. so then if you zoom in closer into the pictures uh, or like, you know, the props and shit, they had a document there that was like a, a court case about child, uh, um, you know, pornography and or something like that but it was like very um 
you know, insinuating of what they believe in. Uh, and again, they blamed it on like like the shoe company, Balenciaga. Yeah. Or like the, the, the fashion electric, company. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, they got canceled hardcore. Super oh. hard. And so <laughs> then you look into like the dudes who actually own Balenciaga and the other companies that they have, and like the one dude owns a um, like an art company, and all the art is like child porn. Whoa. All the art that they sell is child porn. Yeah. Super, you know, crazy. But um, going back to the Bud Light thing, the lady who ended up, like, getting canned, shit canned for, you know, making that decision, like, she was basically saying, like, she threw the customers under the bus. She was like, we don't want the, you know, 30-year-old males as our customers. I saw that. And in her background, there's, like, a crayon drawing of, like, a, like a huh. pride flag. Yeah. It's like... It's it's like you gotta get you gotta know the people who are ninety nine percent of people are buying your stuff, yeah, and not say you don't like them. They're frat guys, dude. But what's crazy? <laughs> the crazy thing though is like that girl. Yeah, she's lost her job and she's onto something else. But really, the people who got screwed by it are the people that ownership of the company and the tens of thousands of people that work for Bud Light. Yeah, I mean, I find it really hard to believe that, like, that decision did not get communicated up the chain to a certain point where somebody was like, hmm, I don't know about this. <laughs> like, I don't think that there was as much of a blind eye as they, like, perceived there to be. Do you, you think the, like, you think that they knew, like, hey, we're doing, we're sending this can? Because I think you do. For sure. I think that there's, there's no way. Like, I, I think that there's someone here who had the final say, and it might have been that girl. No. Nope. Target just did something really similar, super fucked up. That. North Face just did it. And so you're telling me that all of a sudden, just so happens that there are th three rogue employees at three different massive companies that are like, you know what I'm going to do? I want to put some pride or, you know, LGBTQ out there mm. with without anybody saying like, hmm, I don't know about this. Absolutely not. So you think there's like a coordinated mission? Anytime that you see something blow up. In the way that it has, there's usually some sort of like agenda behind it. Well, dude, join us for part two where we talk about conspiracies. Cons <laughs> conspiracies. Yeah. yeah conspiracy theories. Thank you, dude. I appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, thanks man. for yeah, being thank here. Thank you, man. That was